I'm Robert Ubix. This is the second lecture in the series of revision lectures on the subject of the law of contract. In the previous lecture, I looked at the ingredients for a valid contract and said there were four, offer, acceptance, consideration, and intention to create legal relations. I looked at the nature of an offer in the previous lecture, and in this lecture, I want to look at the other three ingredients, acceptance, consideration, and intention to create legal relations. As I said before, an offer requires acceptance, and the offer will not ripen into a contract until it is accepted by the person to whom the offer is made, who we usually call the offeree, and communicated to him. So you need two ingredients. You need the actual fact of acceptance, and you need the communication of the acceptance. And the acceptance must be made in response to and must correspond to the terms of the offer. In other words, there must be an exact match between the, uh, the offer and the acceptance. And if the, there isn't, then it's arguable that a, a contract will not come into play. I've looked already at the problems of negotiations in the case, the case of Clifton and Palumbo, where the, an estate owner said, I'm prepared to offer you my estate for £600,000. I also agree that a reasonable and sufficient time shall be granted to you the examination and consideration of all the data and details necessary for the preparation of the schedule of completion. And it was held that this letter was not a definite offer. The question which then arises is whether the acceptance can be by conduct. This takes us to the case of Brogdon versus Metropolitan Railway Company, a decision of the House of Lords in the 1870s. And that deals with two matters. Firstly, it deals with acceptance by conduct. And secondly, it deals with the insertion of a new term into a contract. The facts of the case are these. Brogdon had for years supplied a railway company with coal without a formal agreement. The company wished to regularise the situation, so they sent a draft form of agreement to Brogdon. <clears throat> he inserted a new term into the contract, or the draft, and returned it marked approved. The company's agent put it in his desk and it laid there for two years. And for two years, Brogdon sent, and the company paid for deliveries of coal in accordance with the terms of the draft. Well, then a dispute arose, and Brogdon denied that any binding contract existed. The House of Lords held that a contract had been created by conduct, and it came into existence either when the company ordered its first load of coal upon the terms of the draft, or at least when Brogdon supplied it. And the Insertion of the new term by Brogdon, you recall I said that when he um, signed the draft, he inserted a new term into it. Um, that was held by the House of Lords not to amount to an acceptance because he had introduced the new term. And until the person who received the new term had, was aware of it and agreed to it, then nothing could come into existence. So, <clears throat> the, as I say, the acceptance must fit the offer. And then the acceptance must be communicated to the person making the offer. The offeree must, in other words, communicate with the offeror. Well, the general rule is that <clears throat> the acceptance will be valid when it is communicated to the offeror. Now, that's fine if the two parties are in each other's presence. Then there's no problems. Um, because presumably they can hear what each other's saying, unless there's a loud explosion or something of that sort. But in general, the rule is that the offer will be valid when acceptance is communicated to the offeror. If the parties are not in each other's presence, then different rules will apply, depending on whether the method of communication used. Um, and that leads us into the well-known exception of the postal rule. Um, and the rule is that an acceptance by post takes effect as soon as it is posted. In other words, as soon as the letter um, accepting the offer is put into the post box. This was created in a, in a very old case, decided in 1818, called Adams and Linzell. On the 2nd of September, 1817, the defendants wrote to the plaintiffs offering to sell some wool and requiring an answer in course of post. The letter of offer had been wrongly addressed, and he didn't reach the plaintiffs until the evening of September the 5th. And that same day, the plaintiffs posted a letter of acceptance 
which reached the defendants on September the 9th. The evidence was that if the letter offer had been correctly addressed, a reply could have been expected in course of post by September the 7th. On the 8th of September, the defendants sold the wool to someone else, but it was held that a contract came into existence on September the 5th when the plaintiffs posted their letter of acceptance, and that has been the rule ever since. Um, the other point to consider is the withdrawal of the acceptance. Is it possible to withdraw the acceptance once it's been po posted? Well, that's, there's no clear answer to that. In principle, once you've accepted, you should not be able to withdraw, but the, the authorities don't speak clearly about that. But one other thing to say about the postal rule, that it doesn't apply if having regard to all the circumstances, including the nature of the subject matter, the negotiating parties cannot intend that there should be a binding contract until the agreement was received. Um, well, there are other matters to, um, to consider. Um, the case of sales subject to contract is one matter I just want to look at very quickly. Um, th this is commonly the case when you have negotiations for the sale and purchase of land, and the person who intends to buy the land makes an offer which is expressed to be subject to contract. In that event, it's well settled um, that neither party is bound unless and until a formal, co formal contract is made between the parties. So that is um, <coughs> the principle, those are the principal matters that I want to talk about in relation to acceptance. I think one final thing one should say um, about acceptance is um, to deal with the question of silence. Um, the offeror, the person making the offer, may waive the requirement for acceptance to be communicated, as I've said before, but he can't waive the requirement for communication in the, in the sense of stating that silence is to amount to acceptance. That's simply not possible. And that takes us to the case of Felthaus versus Bindley. In that case, uh, Felthaus, um, the uncle, discussed with his nephew, John, the possibility of buying a horse belonging to John. A few days after the oral discussion, John wrote to his uncle that he gathered there'd been a misunderstanding. The uncle apparently believed that he'd bought the horse for 30 pounds. The nephew believed he'd sold it for 30 guineas. The uncle then wrote in reply to the nephew proposing to split the difference and adding that if he heard no more about it, he would assume that the nephew agreed. John did not reply to that letter. The uncle didn't pay any money and the horse remained in John's possession. Eight weeks later, John held an auction sale of the farming stock. He told the auctioneer Bindley not to sell his, this particular horse as it had already been sold. But by mistake, the auctioneer, in fact, sold the horse. Well, Felthaus then sued Bindley in conversion, that, which was to do with um, who owned the horse at the time. The, the court held the horse was not his at the time, there having been no effective acceptance of the offer. And this case shows that where even where acceptance is by conduct, that conduct requires to be communicated. It was clear that the, uh, the nephew mentally accepted his uncle's offer, but that was not revealed to the uncle. He should have gone further. Well, once we've got the offer and the acceptance, then the next uh, ingredient is consideration. You cannot have a valid contract without all four ingredients, which I mentioned earlier, offer acceptance, consideration, and intention to create legal relations. And if there is no consideration, then there will be no contract. So I now want to turn to look at the third ingredient in a valid contract, consideration. The whole case law in relation to consideration really has the idea of exchange in it. And the foundation definition if one likes to call it that, for consideration was defined as, or set out in Curry and Miser, um, as follows. A valuable consideration may consist either in some right, interest, profit, or benefit accruing to the one party, or some forbearance, detriment, loss, or responsibility given, suffered, or undertaken by the other. You could summarize that by saying that consideration is some benefit going to one party, or some de detriment suffered by the other party. 
but they're, but they're much the same thing, but looked at different points of, from different points of view. But the point is that they are an exchange. They're what the lawyers sometimes call a quid pro, pro quo, something for something else. Well, the next thing to look at in terms of consideration is um, what forms it may take. Well, there are three types of consideration to look at. The first two are what are called executed and executory considerations, consideration. And the third one, which I'll look at a little later, is past consideration. So what is executed and executory consideration? Well, executory consideration um, is consideration where both parties have to perform something in the future. So effectively, executive consideration may be described as an exchange of promises. Executive consideration, on the other hand, consists of the exchange of a promise for an act. But you'll see in both cases, I've used the term exchange, which goes back to what I said earlier in the context of Curry and Miser. An example of executive consideration is the delivery of goods by a supplier for which the customer has agreed to pay on delivery. If the supplier supplies the good, He's given consideration in the form of the supply of goods. If the supplier agrees to deliver the goods in the future and the customer agrees to pay on delivery, the consideration on both sides is said to be executory. If the supplier does not deliver the goods, the customer can sue him, although he's not paid for the goods. When he sues the supplier, the customer can point to his promise to pay as being the consideration for the supplier's promise to deliver the goods. So that is what executed and executory consideration are about. But executed consideration, it should follow from what I've just said, it consists of a promise followed by an act. The other point to note about executed and executory consideration, before I go on to past consideration, which in fact is held to be no consideration, is that the, the general rule that consideration must be sufficient but need not be adequate. And what that means basically is this. If I choose to sell you a very valuable car for next to nothing, because I choose to sell it to you for £100 instead of £100,000, without making any mistake or anything of that sort, then that is totally up to me. But there is consideration there. I sell you my valuable Bentley car um, for £100, not £100,000, then that is entirely for me to do. But the law says, the law does not look into the adequacy of the consideration, if I choose to pay £100, not £100,000, or to sell an article for £100,000 uh, rather than £100,000, that's entirely up to me. But the law says the consideration must be sufficient, and that does not mean the same as adequate. Sufficient consideration means such consideration as the law will recognise, whereas adequate consideration means something which is equal in value to that for which it is given in exchange. And as long as some value has been given, the courts will not ask whether adequate value has been given. The other matter to look at is past consideration. Now, past consideration is or arises where there is an act followed by a promise. An example would be this. B cleans A's car. A week later, B offers to pay a. Now, at that point, the consideration is passed. The act has been done, and the person offering to pay need not be bound by that. Past consideration is no consideration. But or an example of that is also the case of R Ross Gawler and Thomas. And in that case, the court uh, was looking at the sale of a horse um, to Ross Gawler for £30. Thomas sold the horse to Ross Gawler for £30. After the sale, he promised that it was sound and free from vice. It wasn't. Ross, Ross Gawler sued for damages for breach of warranty. In other words, a breach of the term of the contract, which I'll look at later. He failed. <clears throat> the only consideration which he'd given was the purchase price, and clearly that was not given for the promise, since at the time of the promise consideration was already passed, and therefore he could not be held to that statement um, that the horse was sound and free from vice. 
So as I say, the general rule is that um, past consideration is no consideration, but there are two exceptions to the general rule. The first exception arises where the act is done at the request of the promisor. If we go back to my example of cleaning the car, if A had asked B to clean the car and then said a week later, I'll pay you for it, then that would fall within that exceptional category. And secondly, the, where the parties all along contemplated that payment would be made. In that case, again, um, the, that would be good, good, good consideration. The other thing to look at briefly before I move on from consideration is estoppel. Well, in these revision lectures, I can only touch briefly upon estoppel. The doctrine of estoppel rose, arose from a case called Hughes and Metropolitan Railway in the 1870s and was given uh, a certain amount of mileage to by Lord Denning in the 1940s. And the principal case to look at there is a case called Central London Property Trust Limited versus High Trees House Limited. In September 1939, on the outbreak of the Second World War, the plaintiffs had let a block of flats to the defendants. In January 1940, they agreed to accept half rent, since many of the flats were unlet because of the war. In 1945, when the war ended, all the flats were let again, and the plaintiffs claimed full rent for the last two quarters of 1945. Mr. Justice Denning, as he then was, gave judgment for the plaintiffs on the grounds that the agreement of 1940 had, by the middle of 1945, ceased to operate by the reason of the change of circumstances. He also added that if the plaintiffs had sought to recover full rent for the period of 1940 to 1945, they would have failed. <clears throat> the principle of the Hughes case would prevent them going back on their promise. So the point about an estoppel is that if one represents a particular state of affairs, then one effectively is stopped or prevented from going back on that state of affairs or on that statement one has made upon which someone else has relied. The final ingredient is the intention to create legal relations. Again, not all agreements are, have, or will have legal consequences. If I agree to take someone out to dinner tomorrow night and then don't appear, then that cannot be said to be a contract which has any legal consequences. So not all agreements to do something amount to specifically enforceable contracts. But the law makes a distinction between commercial agreements and social agreements. And in both those categories, it operates on the basis of presumptions. In the case of a commercial agreement, it is presumed that the, that the contract was intended to be legally enforceable, um, but that presumption can be rebutted by evidence um, to the contrary. And in the case of a social and domestic agreement, it is presumed that legal relations were not intended, but again, that presumption can be rebutted. And basically, a presumption is, if you like, a sort of signpost that points in a certain direction, but the person seeking to rebut it must produce evidence that the contrary was intended. The other matter to touch on very briefly in the context of intention to create legal relations is what are called, uh, is an agreement called a collective agreement. Um, a collective agreement is an agreement entered into by a trade union and an employer and governs the rate of pay and conditions of work of the trade union's members. Sometimes the terms of these agreements are incorporated into individual employment contracts, in which case they're legally binding via the individual contract of employment. But the question remains whether the agreement is binding and valid between the parties to it, in other words, the union and the employer. Well, until 1969, it was generally thought that um, collective agreements were not legally enforceable, and that, that was and in fact remains the position. It's now been reaffir reaffirmed, in fact, by an Act of Parliament, Section 179 of the Trade Union and Labor Relations Consolidation Act, 1992, states that a collective agreement is conclusively presumed not to have been intended by the parties to be legally enforceable unless it's in writing and expressly provides that it's so intended. The case, final case to look at in the context of um, the intention to create legal relations 
Um, in fact, in the context of social and domestic agreements, is a case called Jones and Padavatton, which was decided in 1969. A mother agreed with her daughter that if she'd give up her job and come back to England and read for the bar in England, the mother would provide maintenance for her. The daughter came back to England and began to read for the bar to study to become a barrister. Later, the agreement was varied, um, and a house was agreed to be provided by the mother for the daughter. The mother claimed possession of the house later, but the Court of Appeal held that the arrangement was not intended to be legally binding, and therefore the mother was entitled to possession. But as I said, such agreements may be legally binding if the evidence shows that legal consequences were intended. <laughs>